Today, I'm going to illustrate my talk about philanthropy by telling you a story that dates back to my experience as the president of the Lilly Endowment in central in Indiana. The, the Lilly Endowment uh, was invited to participate in a program at the Hudson Institute, which was then headquartered in Indianapolis. And the purpose of the meeting was to discuss with countries in the Baltic region of the, of the world, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, discuss with their leaders, their economists, uh, and their academics what it was like to convert their governments to democracy. And the purpose of the meeting was to bring their leaders together with people in the United States who could give them opinions about how different approaches worked. And of course the major issue for those countries was whether they wanted to have a democracy in which you had a division of power like we have in the United States or whether they wanted to have a parliamentary system. Well during the cocktail hour that followed this gathering a group of these individuals walked up to me and they saw my name tag and said Lilly Endowment on it, had my name on it, and they, they said, well, what do you do? And I said, oh, I give away money. And they said, that's a good idea. How do we get some? And, of course, my reaction to that was that I could then introduce them to the concept, as we know it in the United States, of philanthropy they had a lot of difficulty even believing that people voluntarily gave of their time and their money to causes of one kind or another and to organizations of one kind or another. And they also wondered if it was maybe unfair that the individuals who gave the money got to pick where it went and what it was to be spent for. They, they thought maybe that was a conflict of interest uh, and would be difficult to justify in their part of the world. I tell you this story because it illustrates the lack of understanding in most parts of the world as to what our philanthropic sector is, is all about. Now the premise of what I want to say today is basically this, and that is that it's my opinion that for a democracy to endure, as ours has in the United States, it's necessary to have philanthropy as part of the culture of, of that at society. Today I'm going to define philanthropy uh, the way Bob Payton, the first director of the Center on Philanthropy at IUPUI did in his book, and that definition is basically this voluntary action for the public good. Now, the idea, of course, that includes people who donate their time as well as their money, and uh, it's a pretty all-encompassing definition. I am one of those individuals who's been fortunate enough during my lifetime uh, to serve in a variety of capacities. I've been the chairman of the board of a major philanthropic organization, a foundation, Lilly Endowment, at a time when it had over four billion dollars. I've also been in the position of being in a situation in, in which I headed the staff of an organization like that. And the, the difference between the perspective of the staff and the board is quite important. And of course, the board has as its major responsibility, uh, making sure that the mission of the organization is met, that the laws of the United States are followed, and that the ethical and moral activity of the organization is of the highest type. The second part of, of, of this uh, conversation takes us into how I got to be in the philanthropic sector. 
I did not aspire to a career. Uh, it happened that after I lost the election for governor in 1988, that Lilly Endowment was looking for a new chief e executive. And I was recruited by then board chairman Thomas Lake, who had previously been the president of Eli Lilly and Company, and then later became the chairman of the board of, of the endowment. Of course, at that time, the major holdings of Lilly Endowment were Lilly stock. And at that time, we had about four plus billion dollars to work with. In this set of circumstances, the uh, background of how a foundation like this functions uh, is not well understood by the general public. And even people in, in the field don't understand the details. What I want to suggest to you today is that philanthropy has a unique history in, in the United States. As early as the early development of the colonies on the eastern seaboard, going back to 1620, in those days, believe it or not, there was an expression of philanthropy. Uh, the expression took two forms. One is the community gathered around and helped people who needed help, those who didn't have enough to eat, those who were poor. And the other thing that developed was the development of the voluntary association. Voluntary association is the organization that people in philanthropy use to accomplish their goals. Now, the voluntary associations on the eastern seaboard actually functioned as if they were government. They had no responsibility to anyone else. The members, meaning the residents of each of those colonies, voluntarily agreed to do what these associations on the Eastern Seaboard suggested was the proper way to do business and the proper way to maintain personal behavior. And, and that's really the early beginning in the United States of the voluntary association and, and of philanthropy. If you want to read a lot about this, you can refer to Alexis de Tocqueville's uh, famous book called Democracy in, in America. This is the story of what Tocqueville and his associates uncovered as they visited all across the United States in a period of almost a, a year. And of course what they found out was that there was an unusual spirit that was part of the culture. It was the, the spirit that said, when you have more assets and you have a little extra time, you have an obligation to give it to society in some form. And of course the classic example is the, the farmer whose barn burns down and the neighbors gather together and rebuild it. And also for the farmer who is unable to take care of his crops, the neighbors voluntarily harvest them and, and plow as a contribution uh, to their fellow citizens. Those are the early expressions of philanthropy. Tocqueville points out that the philosophical background of philanthropy largely comes from organized religion. Uh, of course, in the Christian religion, the, uh, the, the classic example is the Good, good Samaritan. You know, the, the case in which uh, an individual does for another individual who happens to be his enemy uh, what he needed to have done at the time. He needed a place to stay. He needed uh, assistance. And all of the world's great religions, in fact, have this element in them. It, it's the element that says that we have an obligation to help those who can't help themselves. The poor, the disabled, uh, the uneducated, uh, all of those kinds of concerns can be found in the writings and in the practices of the five great religions of the world, not just Christianity. So th that's how all of this began to, to take place in the United States. And Tocqueville found out that we practice uh, this culture in a way that virtually at that time no one else does. Today in Europe and some other parts of the world, 
there are the development of voluntary associations and some forms of charity. Uh, normally in religion you talk about charity, not philanthropy. But philanthropy became the, the name of a, an approach which became popular in the United States at the turn of the, the century. This would be in the 1880s and thereafter. And what of course occurred was that the so-called robber barons of society, these fabulously wealthy men who had built businesses like Andrew Carnegie, uh, Henry Ford, e Eli Lilly, uh, all of these individuals decided that they had more than they really needed. That is more money, more stock, more everything. And, and so their conviction was they had an obligation to in some way give that back to the society that it made it possible for them to do so well. Not all of them had the same motivations. Not all of them did it the same way. Uh, I want to refer you to a classic piece of writing by Andrew Carnegie. It's called The Gospel of Wealth. Whenever I speak to a group like this, you know, I, I have people raise their hands who have read The Gospel of Wealth, and I may be lucky if there's one or two who have. The Gospel of Wealth is a short essay written by a Andrew Carnegie that outlines what he believes society should do and what individuals should do with, with what he calls excess wealth. Now, his philosophy was that you give uh, a, a, a enough in your will or in your estate to adequately care for your family and to provide for the employees of your business. But anything over and above that should be held in trust for the benefit of society in, in general. That this is the concept that, that Carnegie followed. He also thought you should give it all away except for that that you were going to use for the essentials uh, before you, you die. Carnegie didn't accomplish that, but and very few philanthropists do, but nevertheless, that that's what it says in, in this essay. The e essay also has a second part to it in which he outlines the parts of society that he thinks qualify for this kind of, of, of approach. And, and of course, education, the libraries, uh, all the things that you associate with, with Carnegie are included in that list. The list is just about as good for today's world as, as it was then. But we ob obviously have become more sophisticated and uh, the Historians would suggest that these two uh, individuals, or at least four or five individuals, created what they called scientific philanthropy. That is, an organized approach at giving away money. I do remember going to a meeting uh, that was held for very wealthy individuals. And, and uh, I was there because I was supposed to be a source person. And the people who were there were individuals uh, from the famous families of, of America, the Rockefellers, the, the Fords, and the Waltons. Uh, now, the, the, these were actually the people who started Walmart. And it, it seemed to me preposterous for me to go and tell them what they should do with their money but I found out quickly that they considered giving away money much more difficult than making it in the first place. So what happened, of course, uh, as we moved along in, in the society, uh, the government reacted to the philanthropic impulse and recognized the fact that it was part of our, our culture. And, and so in 1913, the income tax was made possible. An amendment to the U.S. Constitution allowed the Congress uh, to enact an income tax, which was first applied to individuals and later to corporations. And in the drafting of these two taxes, the government provided for 
a deduction from taxable income for charitable contributions, which met the guidelines of the statute. And, and so, of course, what happened was that uh, an industry began to develop. Uh, more and more people decided to make contributions, sometimes because they were passionate about the cause, other times because they thought it would be desirable to have a reduction in their taxable income. Then after the deductions for income taxes occurred, a number of reformers became concerned about this philanthropic segment. And they were afraid about abusive behavior that would uh, not be in the best interest of society. And, and so in uh, uh, 1969, a statute was passed which provided, first of all, that in a foundation that you must give away in the current year an amount equal at least to 5% of the value of that estate in the previous year. You know, so if the Lilly Endowment had uh, $500,000 and uh, uh, in the previous year in, in their portfolio, uh, during this next year you had to give contributions of at least uh, 5%. That 5% rule is still on the books in the United States and applies to, to foundations of a variety of types. It's also become a, a standard for uh, philanthropists to use in managing uh, the size and the maintenance of their foundation. It's been figured out that you can give away 5% a year without substantially reducing the corpus or the amount of of the foundation. And obviously, in different years it varies, but it averages out uh, over uh, longer periods of, of time. The other things that were called for in this legislation was the creation of the 990 reporting form. The 990 are the numbers that the Internal Revenue has placed uh, on this form, and it is a report that every philanthropy Every nonprofit in the country makes to the U.S. Treasury each year. They are also required to file a copy of those returns with the Attorney General of each state. Now, what this tells you is there are only two governmental entities that actually play a role in governing or controlling the nonprofit world. The, the first is the Internal Revenue Service, which Make sure that you make your 5% contribution. Make sure you file your uh, tax return. Uh, and in that tax return, you also file the salaries of the five highest individuals in terms of compensation. And uh, it also calls for uh, specific uh, factors that deal with the reasonableness of pensions and the like. And, and you accomplish the reasonable nature of compensation and pensions by annually earmarking your work against norms in the entity or at the size of the entity you're in, involved with. So what that means, of course, is that as salaries go up in general in a certain class of foundations, uh, they all go up about the same uh, amount each year. And those are policed by the Internal Revenue Service. The penalty for failing to comply with the requirements of the IRS is essentially to lose your tax-exempt status. Seldom ever does the IRS actually revoke a tax-exempt status. Uh, there have been examples of where they have threatened to do so, and this had caused a change in, in the behavior of, of the leadership of an organization. Uh, we have a controversy right now in the United States about whether or not uh, Donald Trump's foundation, in fact, meets the IRS requirements. The other thing that can take place is that the attorneys general across the United States have the ability to involve themselves in the actual work of an individual philanthropy, nonprofit like the Red Cross, a big endowment like the Lilly Endowment, 
or a small charitable organization uh, at the local, local level, such as the uh, United Way. And what they essentially can do is to uh, file a motion if they find behavior that is either corrupt, self-serving, or in other words, violates the ethical and moral conditions under which nonprofits function. The authorization of the nonprofit status is made by the Internal Revenue Service, and the policing of whether or not those that are nonprofits follow the rules or not is the province of the Internal Revenue Service and the Attorneys General. A little bit later, uh, after uh, the bill was passed and signed into law that dealt with the 5% limitation and the other things I've cited, uh, a private organization called the Filer Commission was assembled by the leaders of some of the large foundations. And the Filer organization ended up by creating a new entity called the independent sector. Now the independent sector is purposely called that so that philanthropy has a place in our total society alongside the political sector and the for-profit sector. So you've got three sectors now, the third one being the independent sector. And the independent sector actually has an organizational structure, meets regularly, has annual meetings, and so forth. Its purpose, uh, again, is to contribute to the ethical and moral behavior of people that engage in, in, in philanthropy. Now, some moments ago, I mentioned the creation of the Center on Philanthropy uh, at IUPUI uh, in, in Indianapolis. And that center, of course, was started with a major million dollar grant from the Lilly Endowment. And it was led by a gentleman named Robert Payton. Bob Payton uh, became the first phil philanthropic scholar in the United States to actually be designated with a chair. It was the, the, the Bob, Bob Payton actually held the chair in, in philanthropy at Indiana University. The, the first chair of, of its kind in the United States. Other educational institutions, including Yale and, and Harvard and Duke and some others, did conduct research about this nonprofit sector. But IUPUI, through this grant and through the other efforts it has made, sought to make itself the, the one place in the United States where there is more knowledge about the nonprofit sector than anywhere else, and a place in which young men and women uh, can actually pursue a career in this uh, culture. And as you probably know, we have a, a large number of people that have come out of the, the center who now uh, hold important positions in philanthropy all across the United States. Now, the, the, the other thing that it takes place here, however, is that Bob Payton recognized that spending money as a nonprofit Soliciting money as a nonprofit, both of those things deserved attention. But the other thing that deserved attention was fundraising as a profession. And so Bob arranged for a fundraising school that had been created in California uh, with the help of Lilly Endowment. It was moved to the IUPUI campus and today conducts classes in. Uh, appropriate approaches to fundraising. And so you've got both things going on there, the Center on Philanthropy and the fundraising school. Both of those are essential in ingredients uh, in the philanthropic culture. Now, of course, the, the third part of that culture consists of volunteer, volunteering your time and effort uh, toward a cause. And uh, those are also covered uh, in, in the Philanthropy Institute's uh, approach to our culture. I, I think the, the other thing I wanted to mention today as we uh, look at the uh, 
situation uh, in the United States uh, is that my view is that for a democracy to endure, that is for it to uh, endure over hundreds of years, and of course our democracy is the longest enduring democracy in the world at the present time, I don't believe it can succeed and remain in place without a philanthropic sector. Now, in the early history of the development of the great foundations, another kind of foundation was also created. And uh, back in 1911, I believe, the uh, Cleveland Community Foundation was created, the first of the community foundations. And shortly after that, the Indianapolis Foundation was, was created. Well, during my tenure at, at Lilly Endowment, I recognized, as did many of my colleagues, uh, the enormous contributions that these community foundations make to a local a part of their state. And it seemed to us to be desirable to encourage the development uh, of community foundations uh, throughout the state of Indiana, maybe throughout the United States. And, and so we developed what's referred to as the GIFT program, G-I-F-T, Giving Indiana Funds for Tomorrow. And the idea was that this would be money to incentivize the creation of local community foundations we would make a, a grant of $2 for every dollar raised at the local level. Uh, we announced this program, and uh, a number of national writers began to find fault with this idea. And matter of fact, the head of the National Council on Foundations uh, was sent to Indianapolis to complain to me about the, this program. Uh, they said, you have to have at least 250,000 people living in a community to have a successful community foundation. You're likely to have a bunch of small ones. Uh, they won't be very well run. They're likely to embarrass the movement. Well, I was floored. I hadn't expected that kind of reaction. And after consulting with my board at Lilly Endowment, and more importantly with a gentleman named Charles Johnson, who led the crusade to create these foundations, we decided to go ahead anyway. And I have to tell you, we had a remarkable re result. Every single county in the state of Indiana is covered by a community foundation, and the amount of assets uh, is, is well in excess of $2 billion and growing every year. Never dreamed this had happened, and of course the experts at the national level didn't think it would happen either. Well, at, this, at about the same time this was going on, uh, it was thought desirable to create an organization that allowed the leadership of these entities, as well as other major givers in the philanthropic field, to communicate with each other and to seek counsel when they had a difficult decision to make. And, and so as a result, a, an organization uh, was, was created to uh, put this group of people together on a regular basis. And the uh, Philanthropic Alliance, which is the organization that exists today, uh, was the final result of, of this organization. And it, of course, exists uh, as a place in which we communicate with each other. And it, it also gives the leadership of foundations a place to get expert advice and information if they need it. Uh, I, I, I think that it also gives us a chance to unify our approach across in Indiana uh, as to what we say about philanthropy. And we can develop uh, certain kinds of programs uh, that might be desirable for the state if in fact they are agreeable to the boards of the local foundations. After we think about the network of organizations, that is philanthropy uh, foundations, uh, nonprofits, 
community foundations and a variety of other things. Another kind of philanthropy not recognized by many is the so-called 501c4 instead of 501c3. And of course, it exists to provide an organization with the ability to lobby for a cause. And it's the very specific rules and regulations that uh, determine what kind of work they can do. But nevertheless, that's all part of the, 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 the network. Well, you heard me say when I started this talk that I think it's necessary for a democratic society to continue in existence if it has a nonprofit sector. Without a nonprofit sector, I think it jeopardizes its long term existence. And I, I, let me give you an example as, as, as to why this is true. The Constitution in the United States, uh, in the First Amendment, uh, which normally is associated with freedom of speech and freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, also includes the freedom to address or redress grievances. And that, in fact, is what this nonprofit sector does for our society. Let me give you some samples. The Tea Party, for example, uh, didn't like what was going on in American politics. Didn't necessarily like even the political parties they were affiliated with. So they started their own party. They called it the Tea Party, organized it in local groups and so forth. Well, that was a way for them to express themselves without violence and in an, an organized way, it allowed them to solicit funds and, and gain volunteers to accomplish their goals. Well, there's another example in, in our society of what this freedom to uh, deal with needs gives us. And I wanna take you back to the era in Indianapolis when the AIDS epidemic was suddenly getting newspaper and television headlines. Uh, suddenly, we had a group of people who were suffering. They were dying, uh, and they were suffering because they had been ousted by most parts of society. As a matter of fact, the image and the uh, aura around AIDS was such that most of the mainline philanthropies wouldn't touch it. Of course, the concern was that you got AIDS allegedly through immoral acts. And so the result of all this was that two small nonprofits in central Indiana decided to do something about it, to deal with the needs of people. The first of these was the Phoenix Theater that began to produce productions that dealt with the AIDS epidemic, dealt with the personal trials and tribulations of families that dealt with individuals uh, who were involved in the AIDS epidemic in one way or another, it began to put a public face on this crisis. At about the same time, a Catholic organization, small group, called the Damien Center, decided that they would minister to the real personal needs of people suffering from AIDS. They maintained a uh, location where AIDS victims could get underwear could get basic personal needs such as shaving cream and shaving blades and, and uh, all the other things that all of us assume are available to us. They couldn't afford them and this was a place to get them. So, so suddenly uh, these two nonprofits had put a, a new image out there for the public to see. And within three or four years, the mainstream of philanthropy reacted and they began to do grants and to do programs that sought to meet the needs of people who were suffering from the dreaded disease. Well, that's an example of why the nonprofit sector is so important to a, a democratic society. I'm convinced that the democratic society endures only when those opportunities are made available to citizens. And so for that reason, I congratulate all of you in being so committed to the philanthropic sector that you want to learn more about it to be trained for leadership. We thank you for doing that. It'll be a better society because of your involvement. Thank you very much.